Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the second session of the virtual conference series, Joining the Circle of the System, Philosophy and Being. As you may know from the previous session, each talk will take around one and a half hours, and we will have a Q&A after the talk. Please use the raise hand button on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question after the talk. Um, today's speaker is Dylan Shaw, who is currently a PhD student in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Toronto. His research interests consist of the history of philosophy from Kant and Hegel to 19th and 20th century European philosophy, including the fields of phenomenology, existentialism, psychoanalysis, and critical theory. His related interests also extend to ancient and early modern philosophy. Today, he'll be giving a talk about the talk titled as The Idea, The Absolute Idea and Absolute Spirit, Hegel on the Enjoyment of Philosophy. I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting talk. Dylan, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And thank you all for uh, being here today. And to the organizers, thank you uh, of this conference series for including me on this uh, wonderful roster of distinguished speakers and for organizing this series on such an exciting and uh, fruitful topic. Uh, I learned a great deal from and, and very much enjoyed last week's presentation. And I'm looking forward to uh, the many more presentations to come. And it's my great uh, pleasure and uh, privilege to share my work with you all today. So I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint to go along with the talk. So the title of my talk is The Absolute Idea and Absolute Spirit, Hegel on the Enjoyment of Philosophy. I'm just going to start my timer, actually, so I stay on time. Hegel's final words of the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences read, quote, the eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. This paper is an effort to understand this single sentence. In what precise sense does the eternal idea eternally remain active, engender, and enjoy itself as absolute spirit? As Hegel tells us, the idea, more specifically the absolute idea, is the sole subject matter and content of philosophy, manifesting itself in three modes, logic, nature, and spirit. Hegel also tells us that the highest goal of philosophy itself the highest shape of absolute spirit, is reconciliation, Versonung, whose achievement allows the philosopher to enjoy the present. Accordingly, I will argue that the absolute idea's eternal activity is its own eternal self-manifestation as logic, nature, and spirit, and that the absolute idea enjoys itself in and through the enjoyment afforded to the philosopher by philosophical reconciliation. I will make this argument with particular reference to Aristotle's views on the relation between God's divine activity of eternal contemplation and the philosopher's human activity of philosophical contemplation. Hegel famously follows his own final words in the encyclopedia with a quotation from Aristotle's metaphysics, describing God as nous, or thought thinking itself, whose activity of eternal contemplation is the best and most pleasant. In the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle maintains that philosophical contemplation, as the human activity most resembling God's divine activity, affords the highest happiness to the philosopher. I will argue that Hegel's account of the relationship between the absolute idea and absolute spirit is a speculative, systematic rearticulation of these fundamental Aristotelian themes with a Neoplatonic bent, as we will see. So this paper has three sections. In section one, I examine the sense in which the absolute idea eternally remains active. That's the first part of the sentence. Hegel defines the absolute idea as the self-thinking idea or self-thinking thought, directly identifying the absolute idea with Aristotle's God, nous, or thought thinking itself. Hegel clearly reads Aristotelian nous in classical Neoplatonic fashion. In thinking itself, nous thinks all that is thinkable, that is, all being, wherein this thought is identical to being. As such, the absolute idea is likewise the absolute method, not only the method for logic, 
but equally the method for the philosophical comprehension of nature and spirit. Of course, this method is not merely a tool or instrument externally applied to a foreign content. Rather, it is the very methodos and logos of nature and spirit themselves, their own most being, life, and self-movement. Indeed, Hegel maintains that nature and spirit are modes of existence or manifestations of the absolute idea itself. Again, I claim that this ought to be understood in Neoplatonic fashion, wherein logic, nature, and spirit are the three hypostases of the absolute idea. And notably, Hegel suggests that Neoplatonism might just as well have been called Neo-Aristotelian, insofar as it is in fact a synthesis of Plato and Aristotle, and that the accepted view of an opposition between Plato and Aristotle is completely erroneous. Anyway, for the Neoplatonists, three hypostases of God are the one, nous, or intellect, and psuche, or soul, where the lower domain of soul also contains phusis, or nature. Hegel endorses the Aristotelian priority of thinking by rearranging these hypostases to arrive at his own set. Logic, nous, essentially, nature, phusis, and spirit, or psuche. For the Neoplatonists, each subsequent hypostasis both eternally proceeds from and returns to the prior hypostasis in an eternal processual activity, often misleadingly known as emanation. Analogously for Hegel, each hypostasis eternally proceeds from and returns to the prior hypostasis in a systematic circle of circles. This is the activity through which the eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself eternally remains active. In section two, I will examine the sense in which the absolute idea eternally engenders and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. That's the second part of the sentence. The highest shape of spirit is absolute spirit, whose three forms serve as three modes of apprehending the absolute idea, art, religion, and philosophy. Art, religion, and philosophy all have the same content, the absolute idea, but different forms, sensuous intuition, representation, or Vorstellung, and the concept, or Begriff, respectively. Philosophy is uniquely capable of comprehending the absolute idea fully and completely, insofar as philosophy's conceptual form is uniquely adequate to its content. As we will see, the highest goal of philosophy is reconciliation, the outcome of which is the enjoyment of the philosopher. Of course, art and religion also have reconciliation as their goal, and bring enjoyment through their reconciliatory activities. But philosophy alone is capable of the highest reconciliation and enjoyment insofar as it is the highest form of absolute spirit. By philosophically comprehending logic, nature, and spirit, the three modes of the absolute idea, the philosopher is reconciled to them and thereby enjoys them to the highest degree. It seems to me that this is best understood on analogy to Aristotle's view of philosophical contemplation. For Aristotle, the highest human happiness belongs to the philosopher engaged in philosophical contemplation, since this activity is the human equivalent of God's eternal contemplative activity. Just as the absolute idea eternally thinks itself as the circle of circles of logic, nature, and spirit, the philosopher thinks the philosophical circle of circles of logic, nature, and spirit. If spirit is itself a manifestation of the absolute idea, as Hegel says, then the enjoyment of absolute spirit, not least its highest enjoyment, philosophy, is in fact the absolute idea's enjoyment of itself in and through absolute spirit, as Hegel's final sentence of the encyclopedia states. In section three, I will consider the following question. Why does the absolute idea eternally remain active and engender itself as logic, nature, and spirit? My answer, in short, so that it can enjoy itself as absolute spirit. The eternal circulation of the circle of circles is an activity generative of enjoyment. The completion of the circle is a moment of enjoyment achieved again and again as the circle eternally circulates. Following Hegel's own terminology, the absolute idea is the drive, the trebe, to eternally engender and enjoy itself as absolute spirit, where enjoyment, 
denotes the eternal satisfaction of this drive. On this basis, I propose a certain analogy between the transition from logic to nature, the free discharge of the absolute idea into nature with which the logic concludes, and the transition from spirit to logic, that is from philosophy to being, which is the theme of this conference series, with which the encyclopedia as a whole concludes. I suggest that the latter transition from philosophy to being can be understood as the free discharge of the philosopher itself, the moment of the philosopher's highest enjoyment, and thus the ultimate moment through which the absolute idea enjoys itself as absolute spirit. So section one, the absolute idea. Let us recall again the sentence under investigation. It's still up here. The eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders, and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. I should mention that the handout has the quotations that will appear on the PowerPoints. So this would be quote number one on the handout. So in this section, this first section, I will examine the first part of this sentence. In what sense does the eternal idea, the absolute idea, eternally remain active? I will argue that the absolute idea's eternal activity is its own eternal self-manifestation as logic, nature, and spirit. What precisely is the absolute idea? The absolute idea, first of all, is the final moment of Hegel's logic, bringing logic to its completion and consummation. In the Encyclopedia Logic, Hegel first describes the absolute idea thus, and this is quote number two. The idea as the unity of the subjective and the objective idea is the concept of the idea for which the idea as such is the object. This unity is accordingly the absolute and entire truth. The idea thinking itself, and here indeed as thinking, as the logical idea. And then Hegel goes on to explain in the addition, up to now we have had for our object the idea in the development through its diverse stages. Now, however, the idea is objective with respect to itself. This is the noesios noesis, what Aristotle already designated as the highest form of the idea. Of course, this invocation of Aristotle's noesios noesis refers to thought thinking itself, which is Aristotle's conception of God as nous. And indeed, Hegel appends an untranslated and unexplained quotation from Aristotle's Metaphysics, Book Lambda, Chapter 7, to the end of the encyclopedia, which describes God in precisely these terms. And this is quote number three from Aristotle's Metaphysics. Aristotle says, and thinking in itself deals with that which is best in itself and that which is thinking in the fullest sense with that which is best in the fullest sense. And thought thinks on itself because it shares the nature of the object of thought, for it becomes an object of thought in coming into contact with and thinking its objects, so that thought and object of thought are the same. For that which is capable of receiving the object of thought, that is the essence, is thought, but it is active when it possesses this object. Therefore, the possession rather than the receptivity is the divine element, which thought seems to contain. And the act of contemplation is what is most pleasant and best. If then God is always in that good state in which we sometimes are, this compels our wonder. And if in a better state, this compels it yet more. And God is in a better state. And life also belongs to God. For the actuality of thought is life and God is that actuality. And God's self-dependent actuality is life most good and eternal. We say, therefore, that God is a living being, eternal, most good, so that life and duration continuous and eternal belong to God, for this is God. Now, there has been significant disagreement among Aristotle's readers as to the content of God's thought. What exactly does God think when he thinks his own thinking. Some of Aristotle's readers have contended that God's thought must be empty of any content other than itself, a purely self-referential, self-regarding, even narcissistic perhaps, thought that thinks only its own activity of thinking to the exclusion of any and every other possible object of thought. It seems to me that this cannot be Hegel's reading of Aristotle's God. Rather, to my mind, Hegel clearly reads Aristotelian nous 
in accordance with the classical tradition of Neoplatonists like Plotinus and Proclus, about whom I will say more in a moment, in thinking itself, nous, thinks all that is thinkable, that is, all being, that is, anything and everything that is. For Hegel, as for the Neoplatonists, thought, in thinking being by thinking itself, is identical with being as such. It is in this sense, I claim, that the absolute idea completes the circle of the science of logic by returning to its beginning, namely being. The absolute idea is the systematic totality of logic itself, which is nothing other than the speculative unity of thought and being. Or put differently, the science of logic constitutes Hegel's metaphysics in the original Aristotelian sense set out in Aristotle's metaphysics, the science of being qua being which would become known later as ontology or general metaphysics. But the science of logic is equally the science of God. As Hegel writes, God as he is in his eternal essence before the creation of nature and of a finite spirit, which Aristotle calls theology, later to be known as a branch of special metaphysics, and which, he, which Aristotle offers as yet another characterization of metaphysics itself, or first philosophy, as he calls it. Readers of Aristotle's metaphysics have long disagreed over the proper way to understand the connection between Aristotle's different characterizations of metaphysics. On the one hand, the science of being qua being, that is ontology. On the other hand, the science of God, theology. In a sense, I take it that Hegel's logic shows that theology is ontology and vice versa, because God is being. In other words, Hegel's metaphysics, the science of logic, shows that the truth of being is the absolute idea, thought thinking itself, that is, God. This makes explicit the logic's own beginning, the pure thought of pure being, thereby completing its grand logical circle. As Hegel writes, the absolute idea is being, imperishable life, self-knowing truth, and is all truth." End quote. The absolute idea is likewise the absolute method that through which thought thinks anything and everything that is thinkable. The absolute method, as the absolute idea, is again nothing other than logic itself, the form of the inner self movement of the content of logic. But the absolute method is not only the method for logic, it is equally the method for the philosophical comprehension of nature and spirit. That is, the philosophies of nature and spirit use the forms of thought of logic to comprehend natural and spiritual realities. Again, this method is not merely a tool or instrument externally applied to a foreign content, but rather it is the very methodos and logos of nature and spirit themselves, their own most being an inner self movement. And indeed, even more than that, Hegel maintains that nature and spirit are modes of existence or manifestations of the absolute idea itself. And this is quote number four, the absolute idea is the sole subject matter and content of philosophy, since it contains all determinateness within it, and its essence consists in returning through its self-determination and particularization back to itself, it has various shapes, and the business of philosophy is to recognize it in these. Nature and spirit are in general different modes of exhibiting its existence. Art and religion, it's different modes of apprehending itself and giving itself appropriate existence. Philosophy has the same content and the same purpose as art and religion, but it is the highest mode of apprehending the absolute idea because its mode, that of the concept, is the highest. Derivation and cognition of these particular modes are now the further business of the particular philosophical sciences. Of course, we'll have more to say about art, religion, and philosophy in a moment. So in one sense, the logicality of the absolute idea, as Hegel says, can be called a mere mode of it, but it may likewise be said that the absolute idea's logical mode is the universal mode in which all particular modes are sublated and enveloped, the idea itself in its pure essence. Again, I claim that this ought all to be understood in Neoplatonic fashion, wherein logic, nature, and spirit are the three hypostases of the absolute idea. But before explaining this, however, I, uh, it will be worth noting the following. In his lectures on the history of philosophy, 
Hegel calls Neoplatonism, and I quote, the height and indeed the zenith of ancient philosophy. He notes that Neoplatonism might equally have been called Neo-Aristotelian, insofar as it is in fact a synthesis of Plato and Aristotle. Hegel laments the prevalence of the erroneous view that Plato and Aristotle are fundamentally opposed, typically cashed out as an opposition between Plato's idealism and Aristotle's purported realism or naturalism. In fact, Hegel claims that Aristotle exceeds Plato in speculative depth insofar as Aristotle upholds the deepest speculative idealism found above all in the primacy Aristotle accords to thought thinking itself. Now, for the Neoplatonists, chiefly Plotinus and Proclus, the three hypostases of God are the one, nous, usually translated as intellect, and psuche, or soul, where the lower domain of soul, again, also contains phusis, or nature. The Neoplatonists side with Plato against Aristotle here by placing nous after the one, where the one is identified with the good. As in Plato's Republic, the good is beyond being, hence beyond thought, and so beyond nous. For the Neoplatonists, thought thinking itself cannot serve as the true first principle of all, since it contains a minimal division or difference between thought and the object of thought, even when thought thinks itself. Only the absolute unity of the one prior to both thought and being can serve as a first principle, the first hypothesis of God. In contrast, Hegel here sides with Aristotle against Plato by affirming the primacy of thought. For Aristotle, nous is itself the highest good. For Hegel, the absolute idea, of course, includes the good as the speculative unity of the good and the true, which are the two prior stages of the logic. For Hegel, the difference or non-identity contained in thinking is not an impediment to its primacy, as the Neoplatonists believed, but rather its positive condition when understood speculatively, that is, as the identity of identity and non-identity. So in effect, Hegel rearranges the Neoplatonic hypotheses to arrive at his own set. Logic, basically nous, nature, phusis, and spirit, or psuche. And here's a side note, just as the Neoplatonic hypotheses would come to be identified with the three persons of the Trinity by Christian thinkers influenced by the Neoplatonists, Hegel, of course, identified his own set with the same. Logic is the Father, nature is the Son, and spirit is the Holy Spirit. For the Neoplatonists, each hypothesis eternally undergoes a double movement of procession and return. Each subsequent hypothesis both eternally proceeds from and returns to the prior hypothesis in an eternal processual activity. Analogously for Hegel, each hypothesis eternally proceeds from and returns to the prior in a systematic circle of circles. It is this circulation that Hegel explains through the three syllogisms that conclude the encyclopedia. Logic, nature, spirit, nature, spirit, logic, and spirit, logic, nature, which we spoke about at length uh, last week. The absolute idea does not remain in its purely logical form. It eternally releases itself into nature, returning to itself in and as spirit, as the eternal process of its own self-manifestation and self-actualization. This, I claim, is the activity through which the eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active. Okay, section two, absolute spirit. Let us recall once more the sentence under investigation. The eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders, and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. And we're going to hear that sentence a few more times still, so you'll uh, get tired of it. Uh, in the previous section, uh, in considering the first part of this sentence, I argued that the absolute idea eternally remains active by virtue of its own eternal self-manifestation as logic, nature, and spirit. In this section, I consider the second part of the sentence. In what sense does the absolute idea engender and enjoy itself as absolute spirit? I will argue that the absolute idea enjoys itself as absolute spirit in and through the enjoyment afforded to human beings by art, religion, and philosophy, the three forms of absolute spirit. Yet philosophy alone 
offers the highest and most complete enjoyment insofar as it is the highest and most complete form of absolute spirit. So as we've seen, the absolute idea manifests itself as logic, nature, and spirit. The highest shape of spirit is absolute spirit. Those three forms serve as three modes of apprehending the absolute idea, art, religion, and philosophy. This was all stated in a passage quoted from the logic above, which I now repeat in part, which I, and I quote, nature and spirit are in general different modes of exhibiting the absolute idea's existence. Art and religion, it's different modes of apprehending itself and giving itself appropriate existence. Philosophy has the same content and the same purpose as art and religion, but it is the highest mode of apprehending the absolute idea because its mode, that of the concept, is the highest, end quote. Art, religion, and philosophy all have the same content, that is, the absolute idea, not merely in its logical mode, but as logic, nature, and spirit. However, art, religion, and philosophy all have different forms. Art takes the form of sensuous intuition, religion takes the form of representation, and philosophy takes the form of the concept. Philosophy is uniquely capable of comprehending the absolute idea fully and completely, insofar as philosophy's conceptual form is uniquely adequate to its content, and this really achieves the speculative unity of form and content, which Hegel himself elaborates in, in the logic. But what is the point of philosophy? Well, Hegel tells us, in no uncertain terms, in the introduction to the encyclopedia as a whole, that the highest goal of philosophy is reconciliation, or Versonung. And this is quote number five. He says, it is to be viewed as the highest goal of the philosophical science to bring about the reconciliation of reason that is conscious of itself with the reason that exists or with actuality through the knowledge of this agreement. And this assertion here in the introduction to the encyclopedia, Hegel offers it as an explanation of the earlier claims he makes about the goal of philosophy in the preface to the philosophy of right where Hegel maintains that the outcome of philosophical reconciliation is enjoyment. And this is quote number six, Hegel writes, to comprehend what is, this is the task of philosophy, because what is, is reason. To recognize reason as the rose and the cross of the present, and thereby to enjoy the present, this is the rational insight which reconciles us to actuality. The reconciliation which philosophy affords to those in whom there has once arisen an inner voice bidding them to comprehend. And I think all of us here have heard that inner voice time and again. I know mine never seems to shut up. Uh, in short, by philosophically comprehending logic, nature, and spirit, the three modes of the absolute idea, the philosopher is reconciled with them and thereby enjoys them to the highest degree. Of course, art and religion also have reconciliation as their goal and do successfully afford aesthetic or religious reconciliation such as it is to those engaged in aesthetic or religious activity. And here, without saying too much about this, we might note that reconciliation originates as a Christian theological term denoting the restoration of the relationship between God and humanity achieved by the process of redemption. In particular, the forgiveness of sins following from Christ's redemptive death, the resurrection, the descent of the Holy Spirit. But as Hegel argues, Christianity defers the final reconciliation to a future second coming. The present remains unreconciled. For Hegel's philosophy sublates this deferral by reconciling us to and with the present, rather than awaiting a future salvation, allowing us to enjoy the present. As Hegel says, here is the rose dance here. For Hegel, philosophical reconciliation alone affords full and complete reconciliation, since philosophy alone is the full and complete comprehension of the absolute idea. Likewise, art and religion bring aesthetic or religious enjoyment, such as it is, through their reconciliatory activities, for example, the joys of creating and partaking in a work of art, or the joys of religious rituals and celebrations. But philosophy alone is capable of the highest enjoyment insofar as it is the highest form of absolute spirit. It seems to me that this is all best understood on analogy to Aristotle's view of the relation between divine contemplation and philosophical contemplation. For Aristotle, 
highest human happiness belongs to the philosopher engaged in philosophical contemplation, since this activity is the human equivalent of God's eternal contemplative activity. Recall that the quotation from Aristotle's Metaphysics, Lambda chapter 7, which Hegel appends to the end of the encyclopedia, identifies thought thinking itself with contemplation, stating, quote, the act of contemplation is what is most pleasant and best. If then God is always in that good state in which we sometimes are, this compels our wonder. And if in a better, this compels it yet more, and God is in a better state. And I, I note here that Aristotle claims at the beginning of the metaphysics that philosophy begins with wonder, the wonder of ignorance. But here philosophy in fact consummates itself with the wonder of knowledge, that is the divine wonder of the knowledge of God. Contemplation is the best and most pleasant activity. While we human beings can only engage in this activity from time to time, God is always and eternally engaged in this and only this activity, compelling our wonder. That's all from the metaphysics. In book 10 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle develops this point in much greater depth and detail. As Aristotle explains in 10.7, the highest happiness must be the activity in accordance with the highest virtue. The highest virtue is the activity of that which is best in us, the divine element in us. This is thought, nous, and its activity is contemplation, theoria. Therefore, contemplation constitutes the highest happiness. Among all human activities, contemplation is the most continuous, the most self-sufficient, the most leisurely and unwearied, and the most loved for its own sake. And this is quote number seven. If thought, nous, is divine, then in comparison with man, the life according to it is divine in comparison with human life. But we must not follow those who advise us, being men, to think of human things and being mortal of mortal things, but must, so far as we can, make ourselves immortal. That which is proper to each thing is by nature best and most pleasant for each thing. For man, therefore, the life according to thought, nous, is best and pleasantest, since thought, more than anything else, is man. This life, therefore, is also the happiest. Aristotle holds thought to be divine, because God or the gods themselves are eternally engaged in contemplation. And Aristotle explains this in 10.8. He writes that perfect happiness is a contemplative activity will appear from the following consideration as well. We must assume the gods to be above all other beings, blessed and happy. But what sort of action must we assign to them? Aristotle says it would be absurd for the gods to partake in the practical virtues or productive activities, acts of justice, making contracts or returning deposits, exhibiting courage or bravery in the face of danger, showing temperance in the face of the passions and so on. Still, everyone supposes that they live and therefore that they are active. We cannot suppose them to sleep. Now, if you take away from a living being action and still more production, what is left but contemplation. Therefore, the activity of God, which surpasses all others in blessedness, must be contemplative. And of human activities, therefore, that which is most akin to this must be most of the nature of happiness. Happiness extends just so far as contemplation does, and those to whom contemplation more fully belongs are more happy. And as Aristotle will say, non-human animals never contemplate and so are never truly happy. Human beings sometimes contemplate, and so we are sometimes happy. God always contemplates, and so is always happy. And why is it that human beings can only sometimes contemplate? Well, being a human being, one will of course also need external prosperity, for our nature is not self-sufficient, as God's is, for the purpose of contemplation, but our body must also be healthy and must have food and other attention. But we will not need a great many things, and we live in general moderately and nobly as concerns external matters. To sum up, Aristotle ends Nicomachean Ethics 10.8 thus, and this is quote number eight. Now he who exercises his thinking and cultivates it seems to be both in the best state of mind and most dear to the gods. For if the gods have any care for human affairs 
as they are thought to have, it would be reasonable both that they should delight in that which was best and most akin to them, that is thought, and that they should reward those who love and honor this most, as caring for the things that are dear to them and acting both rightly and nobly. And that all these attributes belong most of all to the philosopher is manifest. He, therefore, is the dearest to the gods, and he who is that will presumably be also the happiest, so that in this way, too, the philosopher will, more than any other, be happy. So much for Aristotle. Let us now see how this can be brought to bear on the Hegelian position. Just as Aristotle's God eternally contemplates by thinking his own thought, Hegel's absolute idea eternally thinks itself. Specifically, the absolute idea eternally thinks itself as the circle of circles of logic, nature, and spirit, its three manifestations. Just as Aristotle's philosopher engages in the human equivalent of the activity of divine contemplation, Hegel's philosopher, the highest form of absolute spirit, engages in the human equivalent of the absolute idea's activity. Specifically, the philosophical thinking of the circle of circles of logic, nature, and spirit. For Aristotle, as for Hegel, the philosopher can only engage in philosophical thinking from time to time. In Hegel's terms, absolute idea, sorry, the absolute, absolute spirit, absolute spirit needs nature, subjective spirit, and objective spirit in order to exist. Whereas the absolute idea as such always and eternally thinks itself. Just as Aristotle maintains that philosophy affords the highest happiness to the human being insofar as it is the human equivalent of God's activity, Hegel maintains that philosophy and absolute spirit more generally affords the highest enjoyment to the human being insofar as it is the human equivalent of the absolute idea's activity. Indeed, if spirit is itself a manifestation of the absolute idea, then the enjoyment of absolute spirit, not least its highest enjoyment philosophy, is in fact the absolute idea's enjoyment of itself in and through absolute spirit. In other words, the absolute idea engenders and enjoys itself as absolute spirit, as Hegel's final sentence in the encyclopedia states. Section three, the absolute idea and absolute spirit. Let us recall yet again the sentence uh, under investigation, the eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. Section one, I argued that the absolute idea eternally remains active insofar as it eternally manifests itself as logic, nature, and spirit. In section two, I argued that the absolute idea enjoys itself as absolute spirit by virtue of the enjoyment afforded to human beings engaged in the activities of absolute spirit, art, religion, and philosophy, where philosophy affords the highest enjoyment by virtue of being the highest form of absolute spirit. In this third and final section, I wish to consider the following question on the basis of the proceeding. Why? does the absolute idea eternally remain active and engender itself as logic, nature, and spirit? My answer again in short, so that it can enjoy itself as absolute spirit. The eternal circulation of the circle of circles is an activity generative of enjoyment. The completion of the circle is a moment of enjoyment achieved again and again as the circle eternally circulates. Absolute spirit as the completion and consummation of the eternal circulation of the circle of circles is the moment of the absolute idea's highest enjoyment. Put differently, the eternal activity of the absolute idea is the eternal drive, the trib, to engender and enjoy itself as absolute spirit, where enjoyment denotes the absolute satisfaction of this drive. It is precisely this drive which eternally puts the circle of circles into circulation. In the logic, Hegel explicitly characterizes the activity of the idea in terms of drive. As Hegel writes in his quote number nine, the idea is both the manner of cognition of the concept subjectively aware of itself and the objective manner, or rather the substantiality of things. It is therefore not only the highest force of reason, but rather its sole and absolute force, but also reason's highest and sole drive to find and recognize itself through itself in all things. 
In one sense, the absolute idea eternally finds and recognizes itself through itself in all things, insofar as it thinks all things by thinking itself. Yet in another simultaneous sense, the absolute idea finds and recognizes itself in all things by engendering itself as absolute spirit, wherein ultimately the philosopher comprehends all things through the philosophical activity of reason. Satisfaction of this highest and absolute drive to find and recognize itself through itself in all things is the enjoyment of the philosopher in the philosophical activity of completing and consummating this recognition. Another absolutely crucial moment of the drive can be found in the transition from logic to nature at the end of the logic, wherein the absolute idea in its logical mode freely discharges itself into nature. And this is quote number 10. This idea is still only logical. It is shut up in pure thought, the science only of the divine concept. Because the pure idea of cognition is to this extent shut up within subjectivity, it is the drive to sublate it. And the pure truth becomes, as final result, also the beginning of another sphere in science, that is the philosophy of nature. It only remains here to indicate this transition. In the final paragraph of the Science of Logic, Hegel does not only indicate this transition itself, a transition which is more than a mere transition, as he says. But Hegel gives us a complete picture of where things will go from there. The elevation of nature to spirit, of spirit to absolute spirit, and the rejoining of absolute spirit through philosophy with the beginning of logic, thereby completing the circle of circles. And I quote this long paragraph in full. This is quote number 11. The idea, namely, in positing itself, as the absolute unity of the pure concept and its reality, and thus collecting itself in the immediacy of being, is in this form as totality, nature. This determination, however, is nothing that has become. It is not a transition, as was the case above when the subjective concept and its totality becomes objectivity, or the subjective purpose becomes life. The pure idea into which the determinateness or reality of the concept is itself raised into concept, is rather an absolute liberation for which there is no longer an immediate determination which is not equally posited and is not concept. In this freedom, therefore, there is no transition that takes place. The simple being to which the idea determines itself remains perfectly transparent to it. It is the idea that in its determination remains with itself. The transition is to be grasped, therefore, in the sense that the idea freely discharges itself, absolutely certain of itself and eternally, internally at rest. On account of this freedom, the form of its determinateness is just as absolutely free, the externality of space and time absolutely existing for itself without subjectivity. Inasmuch as this externality is only in the abstract determinateness of being and is apprehended by consciousness, it is as mere objectivity and external life. Within the idea, however, it remains in and for itself the totality of the concept and science in the relation of divine cognition to nature. But what is posited by this first resolve of the pure idea to determine itself as the external idea is only the mediation out of which the concept as free concrete existence that from externality has come to itself raises itself up, completes this self-liberation in the science of spirit, and in the science of logic, finds the highest concept of itself, a pure concept conceptually comprehending itself." End quote. Let us try to unpack this passage. The logical idea is driven by the drive to sublate itself, to freely discharge itself, into the pure externality of nature. This free discharge is the absolute liberation of the absolute idea. Yet this self-liberation, as Hegel tells us, completes itself not in the science of nature, but rather in the science of spirit, the returning to itself of the idea 
However, it is only in the movement from the science of spirit to the science of logic through which the circle of circles is completed, that the absolute idea finds the highest concept of itself, the pure concept conceptually comprehending itself, that is, thought thinking itself. In connection to this, we could spend a good deal of time taking up the three syllogisms uh, and the encyclopedia, logic, nature, spirit, nature, spirit, logic, spirit, logic, nature. But I will instead simply quote Hegel's final two sentences now of the encyclopedia. And this is quote number 12, final quote. The self-judging of the logical idea into the two appearances, that is nature and spirit, determines them as its self-knowing reasons manifestations. And in it, a unification takes place. It is the concept, the nature of the subject matter, that moves onwards and develops. And this movement is equally the activity of cognition. The eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. And accordingly, I want to suggest that we could conceive of the free discharge of the absolute idea into nature as the absolute idea's first moment of enjoyment, or as the beginning of the enjoyment that the absolute idea will finally achieve in and through absolute spirit. I would further suggest that we could see this free discharge as offering a model for the transition from philosophy to being, that is, from spirit to logic which completes the circle of circles of logic, nature, and spirit. Just as at the end of the logic, the absolute idea is said to be shut up in pure thought, and so is the drive to freely discharge itself into nature, which is the absolute liberation of the absolute idea, I claim that the philosopher as such remains shut up in pure thought. Philosophy, therefore, is the drive to sublate itself and its own purity by freely discharging itself into pure being, which would be the absolute liberation of absolute spirit. This moment of free discharge as the completion and consummation of philosophy is the moment of the philosopher's ultimate enjoyment and thus the ultimate moment through which the absolute idea enjoys itself as absolute spirit. Now, just for a very brief conclusion, uh, I will just recapitulate the central claims of my paper in section one, one analogy to the Neoplatonic hypotheses with an Aristotelian twist. I argued that the absolute idea eternally remains active insofar as it eternally manifests itself as logic, nature, and spirit. In section two, on analogy to the Aristotelian relation between divine and philosophical contemplation, I argued that the absolute idea enjoys itself as absolute spirit by virtue of the enjoyment afforded to human beings engaged in the activities of absolute spirit, art, religion, and philosophy, where philosophy affords the highest enjoyment by virtue of being the highest form of absolute spirit. In the final section, I argued that the absolute idea is driven to eternally remain active and engender itself as logic, nature, and spirit, so that it can enjoy itself as logic, or sorry, so that it can enjoy itself as absolute spirit. In short, the eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders, and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don, for this wonderful talk. Now I will leave it to Arleas. Um, he will be moderating the Q&A part. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dylan. Hello, everyone. If you could please uh, raise your hands on the on the Zoom thing, where it says reactions, you have the option to raise hands, and I will make a note. Thank you. Our first question then is from Angelica. Angelica, please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you, Dylan, for this paper. Um, a lot of suggestions there. Um, my question regards that uh, genießen, that uh, enjoyment, that uh, 
despite all your laboring for it, it still remains very problematic for me. Um, you quoted that passage of uh, the preface to the philosophy of right, and uh, actually I just check because I thought, why have I never noticed that? And actually, it's not genießen, is sich erfreuen. It's a different thing. I understand that passage because uh, Hegel's point is to say, once uh, the reconciliation of rationality with uh, actuality, the understanding of the rationality of the present takes place, then I, we as philosophers understand that what appears as contingent has actually its internal necessity. And we can accept and embrace the present, hence uh, be satisfied or be at peace with it. This is how I would translate. I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't translate it as an enjoyment. I don't enjoy the present. I understand and I make peace with the contradiction with it. So I guess I'm uh, reading uh, the dialectic bottom line more in the sense of what is the philosopher to do with the contradiction rather than with the moment of conciliation. So uh, now going back to the last passage uh, of the uh, encyclopedia, uh, what is there to enjoy? I, I find very suggestive the, the, what you are making of the transition to nature versus the philosopher that has to come out of the closed world of thinking but and what's to enjoy in the transition to one's absolute otherness am i enjoying otherness am i assimilating and now the genesis for me has a whole bunch of references that are very much almost uh, organic philosophy of nature is the assimilation so um I guess my question here is a content determined question. What's to enjoy in uh, that transition? To me, the, the transition to otherness uh, is a moment of almost not enjoyment, destabilization. Um, and so, so that's what I have trouble with. But uh, OK, enough with my side. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, very rich and, and helpful uh, question. I'm going to take up a few of the points that uh, you've raised here. So first of all, uh, yes, you're 100% right, of course, that uh, the words that are both translated as enjoyment, and I've sort of played on that, uh, uh, maybe mistranslation in, in a certain way, they are different words in, in the German, as you point out, at the end of the encyclopedia, it's Genesen, at the end, in the preface to the philosophy of right, it's Erfreuen. And uh, that does maybe throw a wrench into my attempt here to, to, to draw a connection between the two. I've tried my best and um, to try and find, I mean, are these technical terms in Hegel's system? And I would love if someone knew the answer to that because my best sense is that they really aren't. And so um, that I sort of take then maybe in a way a little bit of liberty with them uh, to play around with them uh, in that way, because what would the enjoyment be? I think this is a question I'm, I'm struggling with is, um, you know, is it a mere feeling? Well, that couldn't be it because Hegel thinks that feeling is a kind of uh, uh, one-sided or deficient uh, mode of spirit or spirit self-understanding. So then, well, what, what kind of enjoyment is it really? And here, uh, as I was speaking to uh, some folks uh, earlier uh, before the start of the talk, you know, I, I think about it on one, on one hand in kind of psychoanalytic terms I found to be quite fruitful, that what's this enjoyment? Well, it's what maybe Jacques Lacan would call jouissance. And right, it's not the same as pleasure. It's not the same as a uh, uh, sort of mere animal instinctual uh, uh, enjoyment or feeling. Jouissance is precisely the satisfaction, as Lacan says, of the drive. And what is the drive? Well, it's this kind of circular movement, right? It's not desire. Desire is always looking for its satisfaction in an object of desire, which in a way is forever out of reach. And so it can never be satisfied. And the drive isn't to say, oh, we get that object. 
It's to say we come to enjoy just this uh, circular uh, movement in a way around maybe the, the object or around the void that, you know, subject is or being itself and all these sorts of things. So uh, uh, I think I found quite fruitful Lacanian uh, readings of Hegel, which precisely pull on this final sentence from the encyclopedia and say, well, this is actually what Lacan is uh, getting at or vice versa or allows us to understand it in a certain way. But another, another way in which I try and think about reconciliation in Hegel and the role of absolute spirit, the job of philosophy, what it means to enjoy our reconciliation. Another sort of predecessor in this case of Hegel would be Spinoza for me and the intellectual love of God, which for Spinoza, as he says in, in quite an Aristotelian way, maybe through Maimonides and these other folks, uh, uh, is the highest joy uh, that, uh, that a human being can, can get. And in a way, as he says, right, our, our love of God is part of the infinite love with which God loves himself and, and so on. And, uh, and I think, you know, you're exactly right, I think, or I, I very much agree with this, right? What, what is it to find the actuality of the rational and the rationality of the actual? It's to comprehend the necessity of things, which again, Spinoza has his own view of what that means. Of course, necessity may not be the same thing that Hegel understands necessity to be, but in any event, uh, they both are thinking it's about the comprehension of, in a way, this necessity that allows us to be at, at peace with the world, as, as you say. And, and I do think that this is uh, right. I mean, do we say, do we enjoy the present? You know, and again, I, I'm with you that, uh, no, in so many ways, you know, the present is, is uh, I mean, it's a fallen uh, world, as Hegel thinks. It's, I mean, it's a world of infinite suffering, even. I mean, that's what in the Christian religion, which is the revealed religion, teaches. Uh, um, but at the same time, it's somehow out of this suffering or in the midst of this infinite suffering. It is art, religion, and philosophy that allow us to find peace, to make peace with ourselves, with each other, with the world and thereby to experience a, a joy, the joy of, you know, being human, being part of the divine self unfolding, self actualizing through logic, uh, nature and, and spirit. Um, and, uh, uh, yes, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there if I, if that, uh, takes up your question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think the reference to Spinoza, I always thought that intellectual love to God is really very important. So uh, that uh, is definitely uh, on point. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Philip. Thanks, Dylan, for a great talk. So I want to ask you uh, more about reconciliation. And so I have kind of like two questions about that. So the first one is, you know, reconciliation on a grander scale. So, you know, when, when we normally think of reconciliation, we think of like, you know, reuniting things that have been torn asunder, you know, back into an original state. But do you think that's what's really going on in Hegel? That, you know, spirit and nature have been together before but they've been torn asunder and now we're bringing them back together in, in conceptual thinking, you know, uh, is it like that or what, what other view is there? Right. So, um, if you could say a bit about, um, about, you know, what kind of reconciliation we're dealing with here, because, um, I'm thinking also of return here in the logic of essence where, you know, what we return to in the in reflection is not something we, uh, we come back to as if it was there to begin with. We may we may sort of make it in the return. Um, and then it seems to me that there is a kind of tension between what Hegel says in the logic and in the uh, philosophy of spirit. And maybe this tension could be, um, so this is the second question, could be um, related to uh, more broadly between uh, reconciliation and self liberation as you know uh, freedom because that seems to be an aspect that is kind of like um, not so well it's not so prevalent in ancient philosophy but it's very important for Kant and modernity and so you know as um, as Aristotle puts it each thing by nature does what is best to it right but uh, what is that nature right and uh, I think uh, with, with Hegel, that nature is basically freedom, right? And 
Brandon puts it like this, our nature is to have no nature, right? So do you see that there is a tension between reconciliation and liberation or freedom here? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for those uh, two great uh, questions. Let me start with the first uh, part here about reconciliation and as you say, reuniting things torn asunder into an original state. Yes, I, I must say that I think that it, that can't be uh, Hegel's position for, for a number of reasons. But, you know, so certainly, I mean, if we think, at least here's how I think about it in terms of the Christian narrative, biblical narrative, which Hegel takes to be expressing the truths of his philosophy in representational form. So, right, in the Christian narrative, we, we start in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Everything's great, you know, and then, oh, we ate from the tree of knowledge. There's a fall. We fall into what? To death, to good and evil, the unreconciled, alienated from God position. And then later on, much later on, redemption comes, forgiveness comes. We're reconciled again with God. Though, of course, and here's another problem Hegel has, right? The final reconciliation is deferred to a second coming, which we're waiting for still, you know. But Hegel thinks, right, well, it's wrong in, in both directions. Why in the first? Well, because there was no original harmony that was then lost through some, in this case, contingent, seemingly arbitrary uh, decision, sin by the first human beings or something like that. Uh, the fall has always already happened. I mean, and in one sense, that's just to say nature, which is the fallen world, good, the idea outside of itself, as Hegel says, the idea held for a moment outside of the divine love, as he says in the introduction to the philosophy of nature, that didn't happen one day. I mean, that's an eternal truth about what nature as such is. And it, it, it was always that way, is always that way, will always be that way. And so the idea, I guess for me, would, would it, it wouldn't be that we somehow have to like take nature back in to that from which it was released if that's the kind of moment, right, the self-alienating, the, the discharge of nature from the absolute idea, this kind of fall into nature, I mean, it's both the moment of creation, of course, but also of the fall, um, right? The, the notion is not that we have to recuperate it back. In fact, Hegel will always say, right, the fall is, is a good thing, of course. I mean, it's what makes us human. And in fact, not only that, not only is it a good thing, in a certain way, the fall is itself redemption. Why is that? As Hegel says, knowledge heals the wound that it itself is. So what was the fall? Eating from the tree of knowledge. But what's the re remedy for the fall? Eating from the tree of knowledge. That's what philosophy does. So, which is another way to say that it's not to, so, okay, here's another way. I mean, reconciliation is reconciliation of contradiction. I mean, that's another way to look at it, broadly speaking. But what does it mean for Hegel to reconcile a contradiction? It means simply to take the contradiction as such, to understand it, to comprehend it. It doesn't go away. I mean, if we take, you know, the opening of the logic, contradiction between being and nothing, you know, becoming, becoming just is the contradiction between being and nothing. It doesn't stop that contradiction from, from happening or being a contradiction, but it allows us to understand it, comprehend it, and I would claim right to reconcile them and the whole philosophy the whole system is this kind of reconciliation with all the contradictions of reality <laughs> itself uh, and it doesn't uh, do away with them they can't they can't uh, be done away with there is no reuniting all things into some original harmony I mean that's the kind of that's the that, that's a kind of a dream an illusion in a way uh, that's in a way an unreconciled thing to think right? You precisely haven't reconciled yourself with the true contradictions of reality if you're still waiting for everything to get uh, to work out when, you know, Christ returns and uh, we all uh, live happily ever after playing harps in the clouds or something like that. That's, that's not what's going to happen. Anyway, okay, that's enough about that. But the uh, question about uh, reconciliation and freedom, I think, and because I, I also realized that I missed the last part of Angelica's question, which is also about, I think, freedom and this enjoyment of the the free release and this sort of thing, which I which I take to be um, the, the right liberation, as you say. So, a big question, you know, what's Hegel's concept of freedom? Okay, some people, you know, look to the philosophy of right. Maybe you know, he tells us about right. That's the freedom. 
so on and so forth. I mean, it's freedom within objective spirit, so on. Good. Uh, objective spirit, though, is still finite spirit. Only absolute spirit is infinite spirit. Okay, so what happens in the logic, though? Transition to doctrine of the concept from absolute necessity. He says to conceptualize necessity is freedom. That's the birth of doctrine of the concept. He says this is Spinoza's intellectual love of God. You know, that's what that means. But then at the very end of the doctrine of the concept, right, the highest moment of freedom, the, 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 to freely discharge oneself, the free release, the absolute liberation of the absolute idea. I think if I, if I want to put, put my, you know, cards on a table or, or wh where do I want uh, Hegel's concept of freedom to be taken from, his really highest concept of what freedom is, it's the absolute idea's free discharge. And now wh what does that mean as a concept of, of freedom? It's a very unusual concept of freedom because you're just releasing yourself in a way you're, you're forgetting yourself. The absolute idea literally forgets itself by becoming the pure externality of space and time. And it does so because it is, it is free in ways, as he says, absolutely at rest, you know, eternally self-certain and so on, that it's, it's free enough that it could even lose itself completely and still not lose itself, still be able to find itself again by becoming spirit. And, and I want to say, well, that's just what the freedom of the philosopher is at the end of the day. All of reality, logic, nature, and spirit has returned into the absolute point, the atomic point of the philosopher and its own thinking. And then the philosopher has that absolute freedom, the uh, absolute resolve uh, to release uh, itself, themselves, into being, in this case, to completely lose themselves, forget themselves uh, uh, in a certain way, and, and uh, uh, simply... Uh, become being a uh, pure being. So again, I don't, you know, that's, that's more of an imagistic uh, kind of answer, but uh, that's the best I've got at the moment. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dylan. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Mika. All right. Uh, first of all, can you hear me well? Yes. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for presentation and hi from Finland, Helsinki, and um, I found the uh, topic quite uh, touching personally since I am doing my master thesis currently from uh, about Aristotle's uh, psychology and specifically the rational part in it. And uh, this is a simple question and I'm perhaps maybe just interested in your reaction uh, to whether you find it interesting that there is this a worry uh, whether we really should translate noesis with uh, thinking uh, since uh, noesis should involve some kind of rational insights which is characterized uh, in contrast to uh, sense perception and it concerns causes and uh, universal necessities and our contemporary like overall like broad notion of thinking it might be a bit like catch-all sort of like an umbrella term whether but Aristotle has in mind like this uh, same notion as he has in uh, his posterior analytics which deals in uh, like immediate or non inferential uh, and simple and uh, necessary kind of cognition uh, so do you find it like interesting or do you think that it could um, affect your reading if you use some other same like for example understanding since there is this uh, recent uh, translation of metaphysics uh, which also deals in uh, metaphysics lambda with uh, rather with understanding than in with thinking and I could perhaps read uh, the quote here it, it's really short uh, uh, and the understanding actively understands itself by partaking of the intelligible object, no eton. So, yeah. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. That's a great question. And, uh, and yes, I mean, I just want to affirm first in general terms, right, the relevance of Aristotle's uh, psychology or the anima. And uh, Segel says at the beginning of the philosophy of spirit in the encyclopedia, the only rational thing that's ever been written about Spirit is Aristotle's De Anima, and you know all he wants to do is really just you know, revive the spirit 
of that rational reflection on on the soul or on spirit on psuche as it's uh, known and and of course he also begins it by saying right that the great uh, command of the philosophy of spirit is to know thyself which is also what uh, Plotinus says somewhere in the Enneads that that's what psychology the study of the soul of psuche of the anima is 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 about but now as for the translation of, of noesis or noose really right as as thinking as I've sort of modified some of the translations I was dealing with in order to keep the continuity of that word uh, thinking. Whereas of course, right, for on one hand, the Neoplatonists, it's usually translated as, as intellect. Uh, and as you say in Aristotle, I mean, it gets different translations depending in a way on, on the context and sort of what Aristotle is exactly saying. You know, of course, I think, you know, for Hegel, thinking is not just maybe like as it is for Kant, right? I mean, to be distinguished from understanding like we could well we could think about something but we might not actually understand or cognize anything by thinking about it and so on that requires more um but for hegel thoughts thinking to me uh i just have this intuitive sense right i mean it means it's the deepest uh a mode of of the spirit and it really includes within itself i think you know reasoning certainly to to grasp things rationally means ultimately right to to think them in uh, uh, the proper sense. And so, you know, but uh, Aristotle de Anima will say very interesting things about noose, I think, which would be maybe another place I could take uh, this project. I mean, you probably know more about it than me. I just know some of the, the general uh, points, you know, about in, um, I think it's uh, de Anima 3, where Aristotle will say things that seem to suggest that in a way there's only one noose or something like that, or, you know, yeah. our noose is really a part of God's noose. I mean, that's certainly how uh, the Neoplatonists will take up the idea of noose, of intellect, of, of what it means. And I think that's good, you know, grist for my mill in terms of seeing the absolute idea as enjoying itself in and through absolute spirit, where absolute spirit is kind of a manifestation of the absolute idea. It's a kind of idea that our noose is not just like a reflection of God's noose, but it somehow participates in it as a part of it or maybe as, again, the Neoplatonists will say, there's like, we have an undescended intellect, which always remains sort of within the divine intellect. And then the part of us that's down here is, you know, just that part of us that has uh, descended. And again, I take this to be also what Spinoza is getting at when he says things like, you know, our intellectual love of God is part of the love with which God loves himself. It's say our thinking is part of God's thinking. More or yeah. less. Can and that's I, why I, I think uh, Spinoza is yeah. a Neoplatonist too, but that's another uh, story. Just a short like follow up for what came to my mind is the most important characterization of the intellect in the anima is like Panta Noei, Noei refers to Noesis kind, kind of, uh, which is located in the third book, fourth chapter, 429a18. And uh, this is really what connects uh, to metaphysics and I was thinking that perhaps if we try to grapple with what Hegel is doing and what Aristotle is doing and maybe if we um, take like the understanding of contradiction uh, as the work of reason, right? Uh, like contradiction is grasped by reason. So uh, reason can be perhaps the same as the intellect and the activity is just understanding without, without like being, I mean, it's not opinion. It's not something that deals with, uh, with, with like falsity. It's just either it uh, activates or it's just ignorance. Whereas in thinking there is error and truth, but in understanding that, I mean, Aristotle says in metaphysics that uh, it's all, it, the alternative is not error, but it's just ignorance. Yes, yes, that's a great point. And, you know, and here there's also the um, possibility, maybe, uh, uh, maybe unfortunately for me, of drawing some uh, uh, distinctions between or uh, put, putting a more one's finger on the differences between Aristotle and, and Hegel, or at least also with the Neoplatonists and Hegel, who seem to think that the highest form of uh, understanding is the intuitive understanding, right? And that Spinoza, too, takes that as the intuitive understanding rather than discursive understanding or discursive reasoning. But uh, Hegel seems to think that, in fact, uh, discursive reasoning is really the highest form of reasoning. And, and you know, he has all of his criticisms of intuitive understanding or intellectual intuition from the 
German idealists and different things like that. So that would that would be another interesting route. But thank you, thank you for uh, pointing me in that direction. Yeah, thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is from Sebastian. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. I'm sorry um, I can't be seen, but I haven't managed to get my camera working yet. But uh, yeah. So um, I think I'm, I might just be repeating what other people have been saying before and what you might have said yourself in your last answer. Um, couldn't one argue um, by referring to the logic that Hegel is not a substance metaphysician like Aristotle, uh, the Neoplatonists, and Spinoza? Um, as he shows in the logic, uh, substance metaphysics self contradicts and has to be, um, or is revealed to be a, a somewhat mistaken form of concept metaphysics. Um, and so when he says um, the concept is a truth of substance, of Spinoza's substance as well, but also the other, um, that they actually are the concept, it's just that they haven't been comprehended to be the concept. So, um, yeah, and he made that possible. And this makes him. Um, um, uh, distinctly uh, post-Kantian in the sense that the concept and the concept metaphysics therefore are based on Kant's transcendental, uh, on a logical insight that is uh, found within uh, Kant's transcendental unity of apperception, um, which entails that uh, the particular and the individual are retained in their freedom uh, with relation to the universal, which entails for the philosophical thinker as an individual that is autonomous and free, that also this thinker is free in relationship to God, the universal, in a way um, that is not possible to think with substance metaphysics. Um, and so despite reconciliation with God, um, there's still a relationship to God that the modern and Hegelian thinker has to God that is profoundly different from the way that substance metaphysics thinks about it. And I think Hegel's, yeah, Hegel's uh, summary of substance metaphysics would be, I guess, that Substance metaphysics is not able to, to really uh, communicate um, individual uh, freedom in the relationship to God. So acosmism in, in Spinoza's case and dependence and psycho psychological dependency in Aristotle's case and, and I would probably also in the Neoplatonic case, which I just don't know so well. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. And I mean, I'm, I will simply say from the beginning that uh, you're certainly right. I mean, that, that, that much I think I, I have to say. But now, uh, uh, which is just to say, of course, you know, Hegel is an Aristotelian, but not simply an Aristotelian. Hegel may be a Spinozist, says, you know, everyone, every philosopher must be a Spinozist, uh, but uh, not merely a Spinozist, and, nor merely a Neoplatonist for that matter. And as you certainly correctly say, what's missing from these uh, substance metaphysicians, if we want to use that term, what's missing is the subject. And of course, as he says, the preface to the phenomenology, right? We have to understand the absolute, both as substance and, and subject. And where does the subject come from? Well, the subject, I mean, where we learn about the subject first through uh, the religious breakthrough of Christianity, which obviously Aristotle uh, is missing, but also, and then through uh, modernity, uh, the breakthrough, which is the certain way, the philosophical birth of the subject. And this is really, you know, what he's, Hegel says in the lectures on the history of philosophy is ancient philosophy finds its culmination with the Neoplatonists who basically bring together Plato and Aristotle in the higher, highest expression of ancient philosophy. And then the only thing that's missing is the only thing, I mean, it's a big thing, but the thing that's missing is subjectivity, which again comes from Christianity and then modernity. And then my formula would be, right, Hegel is the reconciliation of ancient philosophy and modern philosophy, which means of substance and subject. And, and here's a way maybe of putting that more closely to what I was talking about in the paper in terms of thought thinking itself. Here's what I sometimes think, right? Aristotle gives us the notion of God as thought thinking itself. And now what's the beginning of modern philosophy? It's Descartes who shows that the fundamentum in concussum, the Archimedean point on which we can found philosophy is my thought thinking itself. So ancient philosophy is God's thought thinking itself. Modern philosophy starts with my thought thinking itself. And now the question is, how do we show the speculative identity of these two thoughts thinking itself? That is, in Hegel's terms, of the absolute idea and of absolute uh, spirit. And I think, you know, the encyclopedia is in a way just the argument for that speculative identity, which therefore is the speculative identity of substance and, and subject and so on. And if we want to bring it to Kant, I mean, I should say maybe the, the more polemical side of my paper is trying to give something of a 
implicit corrective, not that I you know, take on myself the right to be correcting anyone, but you know, what I view or my own reading have, have seen uh, uh, not come across maybe enough as I have come to think maybe warranted is, uh, right, if we emphasize just the Kantian inheritance in Hegel, which of course is you know, absolutely fundamental for Hegel's project in, uh, uh, in every way, but uh, I, I, uh, for what I was personally missing in my philosophical learning was to see the uh, Aristotelian, the ancient Neoplatonic, and to some extent Spinozist uh, uh, inheritance as well. And it's when I understood that alongside the Kantian inheritance and saw that the whole, in a way, the Hegel's project to complete both and thereby to complete, I mean, if you excuse the grandness of the claim, to complete the tradition of Western philosophy as it began with Plato is to show. To, to fit together these two pieces. That is, say the freedom of the subject, subjectivity, and substance, absolute substance, whether in the Aristotelian or Spinozistic modalities. So uh, I think all of that was just a way for me to try and agree with uh, what you said. But, but thank you again yeah. for using it. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really helpful. I think I just then misunderstood when you said this kind of losing of oneself and so forth, and losing of oneself and God's self-thinking and so forth, that this is what is also happening in Hegel. Um, and, and yeah, I think if one takes this Kanti lesson on board, then this is uh, not happening in Hegel. Um, the, the individual does not lose itself in the way the individual would lose itself according to substance metaphysics in the thinking of God. Yeah. Right. Well, yes. I mean, here's, I'll, maybe I'll say a quick word about that. Right. So, I mean, it's certainly, I want to say, not losing oneself, I guess we want to say in the Spinozistic way or something where we find out that Ultimately, we're just finite modes being pushed and pulled around by the necessity of the laws of nature, which follow from God's essence and this sort of thing. Hegel, of course, will say, right, in Spinoza, we lose subjectivity, subjective freedom. That's the problem with uh, Spinozistic uh, substance. Because for Hegel, I want to say, we're not merely finite modes, as, as Spinoza thinks. We are actually ourselves infinite. We have the infinite in full within us. How? Absolute spirit. Absolute spirit is infinite spirit, as Hegel says, as opposed to subjective spirit and objective spirit, which are merely finite spirit. Absolute spirit is infinite spirit. And so, in a way, the absolute idea, God himself is fully present within us insofar as we raise ourselves up through art, religion, and philosophy to infinite spirit. But I, I want to say, you know, and I don't know exactly how to make this so rigorous, but I want to say that turns out to be different than Kantian autonomy as Kant understands it too. I mean, the perfectly self-transparent, self-legislating, rational individual as it comes to us from Kant. I mean, for Hegel, of course, it does reveal to us in a certain way the freedom of the subject, but in a one-sided way, just as substance metaphysics reveals the, uh, our place within substance, but again, in a merely one-sided way. And so the sense of losing oneself, the free discharge, the free release, whatever that comes to mean, I think that it must be Hegel's notion of freedom, as I wanted to say, with the absolute liberation of absolute spirit. And that is going to be somehow reconciling the ancient view and the modern view of substance and subject. Uh, that would just be my, my, my programmatic uh, uh, statement. Thank, thank you very much. That was really helpful. Well, oh, thank you. Uh, we have one more question from uh, George, who had to leave, but he just typed it out in the chat. I'll just read it out for everyone. Uh, George asks whether we are to understand the enjoyment as the resolution of the restlessness that Hegel speaks of throughout the encyclopedia. Great. Well, I would thank George for his question, uh, uh, if he was here, but uh, uh, thank you, George, in absentia. Uh, I mean, maybe my answer would just be a, a quick uh, answer, which I guess would be to say that uh, the restlessness, um, I mean, I'm trying to recall the exact passage, of course, there's uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, the restlessness of the negative, which I suppose must be taken from some passage where Hegel uh, speaks about just that. But I want to say, right, the eternal circulation of the circle uh, is a kind of uh, restlessness, restless movement it doesn't come to an end. I mean, it's not resolved and we stop in some sense. Uh, so in that way, right, we enjoy the restlessness. We enjoy the eternal release of logic into nature, nature into spirit, spirit returning to logic. And it's precisely to enjoy the movement. We want to call it 
again, the drive, the circle of the drive. If that's what restlessness means, then I would say we don't resolve it as in erase it or do away with it, but we enjoy it itself. But if we understand restlessness as a kind of uh, alienation that is unreconciled, right? We're just restless because we're waiting for the resolution still to come and we haven't actually understood the actuality of the rational, the rationality of the actual, uh, then that restlessness should be sublated, resolved with reconciliation, with the work of absolute spirit, which then affords the enjoyment that I claim that it affords. So that would be my, uh, my short answer. Okay, thank you. There's one last question from Matt. Okay. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have just a kind of quick question actually about the term drive, particularly because you mentioned and, and you quoted some passage from Hegel too in the handout. Um, I mean, in Spinoza, I can understand like why, for instance, we act like towards happiness or towards joy or towards enjoyment, right? Because it basically contributes to our climatis. So, and since it contributes to our climatis, that means it basically keeps us in existence. So, then according I mean, if we want to keep an existence, which Spencer believes every being has to, I mean, it drives itself towards to be in existence, right? So whatever we act has to be in accordance with what kind of happiness we get from. Um, so in a sense, like I can make sense with, I mean, with Spinoza, particularly considering the term conatus, so why we are kind of like acting towards happiness or, I don't know, investigating God because it is something good for us. And since it is good for us, we can be in existence. Uh, but in Hegel, I think that part, like the part of the Klonautis is missing. So I just like wonder um, what kind of fuels the, or kind of the motivates drive in, in Hegel's particularly absolute idea. So it drives to enjoy itself, of course, but what's the motivation in your reading of Hegel? Great, well, it's a great question. And uh, uh, let me try and say this. I mean, just like enjoyment, as I, as I sort of said with uh, Angelica's uh, first question here, drive, as far as I know, and I'd be very happy if someone has a reference that would uh, correct me, uh, is not really a technical uh, term in Hegel's philosophy, or, or at least, you know, the fact that the absolute idea is driven or undergoes a drive or is itself to drive its own self-driven movement or something like that. I mean, Hegel, in a way, he quite consistently refers to it as that, but he never really spells out, and here's my concept of drive, and here's what it means, da, da, da. So I've tried to pick out those moments in the same way that I picked up the enjoyment to see like, well, what's really at work in Hegel that Hegel himself clearly, I mean, it, these are the fundamental points of the system, but they seem to be uh, right driving it onwards quite, quite, uh, quite literally, um, but right, not like, um, Spinoza's Conatus, I mean, he'll give us a nice systematic account of what it is and why it does what it does and how it works and everything like that. And then we can have our debates about it. But, but this, I mean, right, I guess so, right. The question, the section three that I had was, why does the absolute idea eternally remain active and gender itself as logic, nature, and spirit? And my answer was, so that it can enjoy itself as absolute spirit. And I was hearing from the question, right, but, but, but why does it do that, you know, but why? And, mm -hmm. and my, my, my cheeky answer would be, there's no further why, right? I mean, enjoyment is an end in itself. I mean, and this is what Aristotle says about happiness, right? I mean, what is that thing which we all want for its own sake? And he says, it's actually, it's obvious that it's happiness and we do everything for happiness. And there's no further question as to why we would want that. You know, we want everything for the sake of being happy. And for Hegel, I just modify it, they want everything for the sake of joy and enjoyment, which, I mean, is Spinoza's view too, in a certain way. So, uh, right, that's just to say that enjoyment is a kind of, and this gets me into like the Lacanian psychoanalytic territory, it's this pure excessive thing. I mean, it's not a uh, means to an end, right? It is just the uh, uh, thing that we all want and that we all enjoy for its own sake and the absolute idea i suppose to, to to tie this in the bow right i mean it goes through all it goes through eternally driven in the way it is through this circle in order to to enjoy and i mean this is also in the christian tradition the the highest 
thing is the enjoyment of, of God. And, you know, and, and God is just his own pure happiness, blessedness, and bliss. And, and, and there is no further, further why, I think. Okay, but you are not thinking like God or something basically driving the absolute idea to its own enjoyment, right? So there is no such a kind of like transcendent reason why absolute idea drives itself to enjoyment. Right. Or well, to... the the absolute idea in my in my reading uh, is God. I mean, he's not the God of the beyond, of course. I mean, he's not the God who pulls the strings, as it were. Uh, he's a Right. I mean, it's a, it's a why well, we could go into, you know, what is Hegel's conception of, of, of God, uh, of the absolute idea as God? I mean, the absolute idea is logic, nature, and spirit. I mean, the absolute idea is, is everything, you know? So yes, everything is driven to enjoy itself ultimately in the human enjoyment of art, religion, and philosophy as the kind of uh, uh, consummation of reality itself and as a whole i mean it's again quite quite a grand grandiose perhaps claim but i take it that that is just what uh hegel is saying for better or worse thank you thank you it was great thank you very much uh so we have uh technically reached the end of the session but uh, we have one more question uh, dylan if you're up for the challenge <laughs> yeah okay Gail? I'm happy to stick around yeah um yeah, hello. Uh, it's just a very, very uh, short question, and uh, I think you can answer it quite easily. Um, is there is there a particular logical concept at the end of the logic that ensures us uh, or guarantees that we um, come to absolute spirit? Um, but the background of my question is um, when we read the logic for the first time, of course, we don't have absolute spirit because we don't know, uh, not fully understand what nature is, what spirit is, uh, so on and so forth. So um, is there a um, particular notion, a particular concept of uh, the logical idea, uh, which is our primary concern uh, at, the, at the very beginning when we start reading logic, um, that uh, guarantees um, absolute spirit and uh, the completion of the system? Um, right. Well, it's an interesting uh, question, something I have to think about perhaps a little more deeply than I can off the cuff. But, you know, in one sense, I would say, well, you know, no. I mean, we get to the absolute idea, to the end of logic. All we know at that point is the whole circle of logic. And then we have to go through the philosophy of nature to see what nature is. We see what it is. And then from there, we go to spirit. Then we see what spirit is. And oh, at the end of spirit, we see that it completes itself in absolute spirit and we sort of couldn't have known that uh way back when in logic when we got to the end of the logic but of course it's a circle so at some level unbeknownst to ourselves on the first reading right it must be the case that it will eventually take us there and i mean on second reading perhaps we can see that well if the absolute idea is thought thinking itself but it refuses to remain or can't remain merely shut up in pure thought but as it is as it were release itself into the pure externality of space and time if we see that well being what it is the absolute idea will have to return to itself at some point you know maybe we get a sense that absolute spirit will be to to come but it's not a logical truth i would claim that there is such a thing as absolute spirit i mean it's not that's why it belongs to the philosophy of spirit and not science of logic. And then we could get maybe into a discussion about the sort of presuppositions, for instance, of doing philosophy of nature, Hegel says, as to take its cue from the empirical sciences, the empirical natural sciences. So, you know, again, it's not logically deduced that there are such things as, you know, mechanics, physics, organics, and so on, just as it couldn't be logically deduced that there are such things as subjective spirit, objective spirit, and absolute spirit those are realities of in the sense of real philosophy beyond what logic alone can tell us that we use the logic and philosophy of nature and spirit are kind of applied logic as hegel says somewhere uh so yes yeah, so i think those those are two ways in which one could see sort of the both sides of that question thank you <laughs>
Okay, well, Dylan, thank you very much for your presentation today. And thank you to everyone who has attended. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for your great questions. Have a good week.